back home from the war. T talk a little bit about what you ended up doing as far as a career and talk a little bit about the family and we'll wind down this interview. Okay, uh, well, when I, when I got back, I, uh, I couldn't find the work that I liked or couldn't find anything. You know, like Victoria, there was no job. Yeah. If you weren't a farmer or an oil man, you didn't have any job. You had to work for them, which was okay. And I had been a truck driver before I went in the military. I'd, I had the uh, experience of a lot of things, and I got back into the business. But it was jumping from one job to the next. To give you an idea what I'm talking about, when I worked for Vic Baum, he was the nicest guy. He was in charge of the uh, oil wells at Great Bend, Kansas, and I had to drive 65 miles right. one way right. to get to work in the morning. Right. And at that same time, I couldn't do that all the time. Yeah, I just right. did it to get a few dollars together. Right. Needless to say, we struggled very hard, Don and I. We struggled hard because you just don't make it on $90 a month, yeah. you know. Okay, we decided... Uh, Oh, no, I got, I, I, one of my second jobs was taking care of uh, Do Fort Hayes, Kansas Experiment Station. I worked for Dr. Franklin, and he asked me, what would you do if I'd ask you to do it? I said, what would you ask me to do? I said, I'd probably have to do it. And then he said, well, it's not going to be easy. He said, but I'll train you. Needless to say, he, he was in the uh, agricultural progress studying the environment. In fact, my experience there got me to go, that he wanted me to go to South Africa with him to study the uh, climate and everything. He assigned me to 12 units, if you can imagine, this was honeybees, taking care of ten, uh, 12 colonies, millions and millions of bees. Wow. And he said, do you want to do it? I said, I got to eat. You fly, see the determination again? You don't like it. You, you don't have to like it yeah. as long as you do it. Yeah. And we made a few, we made a few dollars there. And finally, when Don and I got to talking about it, we decided we can do better than that. So I had I had two brothers back in Minnesota, in Mankato, Minnesota. And I said, Mom, why don't we load up? I called her mom, yeah. you know, because yeah. she had 42 foster kids. So that's why we called her mom. And. Uh, Anyhow, we decided we were going to take a trip to Canada and ease our heads, just relax, whether we got anything. But needless to say, uh, we didn't make it to Canada. We, 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 we hit Mankato, we stopped at my two brothers. They were very glad to see me, and so, so glad, thanks for coming up. We were get, getting ready this summer to blah, blah, blah. You know how to visit and stuff like that. And Clarence said, is there anything we can do for you to help you out? I said, yeah. I said, Clarence, I need, I need uh, a job for two weeks. I got to buy new tires for this car. I shouldn't say it out loud, but Donna drove it 18,000 miles without rotation. <laughs> I said, so we, so we, need, we need new tires on this car. And he said, in other words, you're looking for a wreck. I said, Two weeks, if I can just squeeze in two weeks to get a couple of paychecks. And uh, he said, well, here, he picked up the phone, he dialed him, and he said, here, ask for Joe. When I, just, when I said, can I possibly speak to Joe? And uh, he answered, and he said, what do I call you this? I said, what's his name? Washington, are you Clarence's brother? Well, needless to say, that's when we fell into conversation and I went to work the next day at the Continental Can Company. And I told him I wanted to work there for two weeks to get money enough to keep moving. Needless to say, I was there for 15 years. <laughs> when you're good, you're good. Yeah, right. when, and I mean a worker. I was referring to my ability to work. Hmm. Well, I was with the can company out here for 23 years. I mean, the uh, uh, Woodward Governor's Company. So, so 15 with Continental Can, and then 22 with Woodward. Yeah. And of course, I worked two off 
off beats for Nelson Chrysler Plymouth for two in between. I never quit there. I just uh -huh. held on two jobs. Uh -huh. So what brought you here to Colorado? Uh, we used to come out here on vacation all the time, you know? And the kids just loved everything out here. There was something about Colorado that digs in your heart mm -hmm. and your soul. Yeah. It just it just wants to crimp you. Yeah. You know? And uh, I guess what really sold me was was uh, we came out here and we uh, as we were walking around, looking around, this real estate guy approached us and asked if he could help us. Well, there was a long drawn out story there. In other words, he helped us find our first home. He was God himself to us because we would have never made it out here without him. And I can't even come up with his name because I just don't remember names anymore. Yeah. You know, but mom swears by him, you yeah? sometimes ask her. But, and, and I thought, if that's the kind of people that are out here, I belong in him. We saw more of Colorado uh, coming on vacation than we did moving out here. Mm -hmm. Because once we were out here, I had to go to work. Yeah, yeah. You see? Yeah. So, go ahead, go with your question. Okay, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start to wind down. Uh, talk a little bit about family. Uh, how many children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren? Well, I can simple that. <laughs> yeah. but I, I think I got uh, uh, two grandchildren and a uh, family of five, and we had uh, 42 foster kids. And uh, they were so important that they're still communicating. Oh, by the way, Joy, I still haven't seen those beds that Je Jeannie sent out. Yeah, okay, I'm going back to him. Anyhow, uh, unfinished business with her. Anyhow, I, I didn't do anything except work. Yeah. I, when, I, when they put my butt down at Woodward on a chair, with my capability of crafting, is to put small stuff together. They they trusted me on circuit boards that got went into submarines and stuff wow. like that. Yeah, I mean, Woodward Governor Company. I shouldn't say that on the camera, but they had benefits galore. Now I we made a living. Let's good. put it that oh, way. Good. I made a good living. Yeah. And w when I needed something by myself for myself, I had got the, I got together with my two, my my brother. That even held true back in Minnesota. We hunted for the American Legion back there, and all proceeds that we dropped went to the vets hospital in Fort Sne Fort Snelling in Minnesota. Coming back, and it, it held true here too, with the um, uh, well, let's just say. I'm life membership with uh, with the VFW, DAV, American Legion, and that flag out there, you might want to take a good picture. That will fly out there until we get the boys home from wherever they are. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they have a country to enjoy like I yeah. am. Yeah, you know, yeah. But, wow. you know, I'm getting old and yeah. looking at it that way. Right, 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 right. But I'm all positive for moving forward with whatever it takes to help these people. Well, let me ask you too, uh, as, a, as a Korean War veteran, the Korean War is called the Forgotten War. You guys are called the Forgotten Veterans. What do you think about that? I mean, what, what over the years? I never, I never gave it much thought, except for when I, whenever I thought of, uh, I'll be honest with you, when I thought about Korea, I was looking at the poor things in Vietnam. Really? Look at the odds and ends they went to. If I didn't see action like that, yeah, you remember, right, I yeah. had no casualty. I was, I was not wounded or anything. I, but these guys coming out of Vietnam with those high explosives, yeah. and they were fighting from the enemy behind. Yeah, we always had a chance to look out and alert, security ahead, and we we were okay. Yeah, we you, had a lock. You horns. had a front line. They yeah, did. we had a lock horns yeah. with them face to face. Yeah. We're in Vietnam. They come out of the woodworks plus the elements again. Yeah, right. The snakes, the yeah, owls, all yeah, this yeah. lizards and stuff. That's I felt more sorry for them than I did about anybody in Vietnam. I yes, I felt very bad about the wounded. Yeah. I had a chance 
uh, not much, not much, but there are people in our in, in our uh, hospital in, in Tokyo that will never ever see the states on account of their whatever disabilities yeah. or the way they are because uh, that's just well that, I'm talking about the 50s now yeah. you know the way it was then I don't know about nowadays yeah. so no I I felt I'm there I felt very comfortable and I had a lot of sympathy wow. for Vietnam veterans. Well, the last question I always like to ask on these interviews, how do you think that time in the service and in Korea affected your life, played a role in your life, changed your life, or did it? Or was it just simply a, a chapter in your life that you went through? How would you answer that? I, I would say my, my, my sister-in-law, Georgian had her right. It made, made a man out of me to all responsibilities. Before I went into the military, I was kicked kicked around by job, not having a job, blah, 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 not from one day to the next. And there wasn't much in my family. My dad was a carpenter, but he was getting old. You got to remember, he had nine yeah, boys, yeah. and he was way up there in the year, yeah. never owned a car, yeah. and we, we, we just depended on family, sticking it together, you know? Yeah. And I, uh, I, I try to stay busy. That's what that was. That's my goal, and it still is my goal, and it still depresses me because I can't do more for my wife around mm. here. Yeah, wow. That uh, she she was uh, born and raised to be a worker on the yeah. farm, yeah. running the combines and yeah. the cattle. Yeah. Like she like she told her dad, I'd rather go out and work with the cows than to do the dishes. Yeah. You know, and which she did. Yeah. But I got to throw this in. Her dad was, uh, was my friend all through life after our marriage. He was my number one friend. When, and I'll quote him like this. When he asked me a question, I, this is the way he would do Now, y'all, Linus, uh, I got this. I want to ask you this. I want to ask you. And I want your opinion on it. Isn't that saying a yeah, lot? Yeah. How he relied on me for conversation for friendship, for anything, for help. I'll give you a hint when I'm talking about help. I got paid good at, and, I, and I was on a two week vacation. I took two week vacation. Two of their boys were, two of their boys were, uh, one of them was being drafted for the military and the other one was in the hospital. And mom called me, she said, I'm calling you now and, and telling you to come down here. Dad needs help. I said, okay, what are we talking about? She said, harvest. I took a two weeks vacation and uh, I kind of uh, buckled in there. I had a little bit of trouble with my supervisor. He said, hey, I got to do this. Those people need me. And old John Funnenberger was my boy. He, he was a big old chubby. He said, there ain't a damn thing we can't do if we work together. That was his quote, you know, and that's the truth. And I said, are you going to give me the vacation? He says, no, but I'll give you time off. I said, you can even have my vacation pay. He said, oh no, that's what I'm talking about. I'm giving you time off with pay. Oh, wow. So he said, you, if you want to take out time on vacation, take it, said, do, take it the way you want, but you do what you have to do. And I came down and that was the first hardcore snag that I kind of hit with my, it wasn't a problem, it wasn't, a, it, it wasn't anything. My mother-in-law appreciated that I took the liberty coming down here when she knew I didn't even have a vacation coming or nothing, but I did fill in the gap. I said, Mom, you depend on me, I'm here. And when she tried to uh, finalize this, she tried to pay me, I took the check and tore it up. <laughs> That's when the first snag I hit with my mother-in-law. Uh -oh. <laughs> she did not approve of what I did. Yeah. And she let me know. And I said, well, I guess we'll have to live with it. <laughs> That's what I thought. I said, you, I'm happy if you're disappointed. I said, That's, I can't control it. It didn't say it in so many yeah. words. Yeah. But you didn't talk much. She controlled. Yeah. She, she controlled. And it's exactly what my wife yeah. 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 They want to take charge. Yeah. And they know how to take charge. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, Linus, I want to thank you for sitting down today to, to tell your story, but just as important, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Don't thank me. Thank God that I was able to go. Hmm. And I'd do it all over again if I could. Wow. wow. I would not, ever. You know how I feel about it. Going through life with the uh, uh, odds and ends, I think that my, my military career, like Georgine said, made a man out of me and showed me that other people live and they want to live and I want to live. Family. Yeah. And this little gal has taken me through through prayer. Wow. So very good. But I do want to show you some of my little relics. We'll do that. And you can take pictures, you can do anything you want to. My gunnery crew and the 60 millimeter mortar in Korea. Aboard ship and, and the first sight of Korea. Now, what were your thoughts? Did you remember your thoughts there? I mean, here you're going into war. What, what the hell is, what the thoughts were? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> you didn't, that was a picture of me and my mortar, my first assignment that I was going to be educated to and going to war with. But it was taken at Fort Riley, Kansas. I was going to say, because you had the tent. It doesn't make any difference, yeah. does it? Yeah. No? Okay. No. Good. There's front lines in Korea and we're doing their gunnery check and getting our first home. We were isolated. And, and that's that's where you lived in? in yeah, yeah, that's the bunkers that bunker. were in the oh, Okay. Uh -huh. We had beds in there. Wow. Getting acquainted with the tankers that we were protecting. Supporting. One of my students is getting an education on the 57 recoilless rifle, and I had to know how to run this thing. A 36 year war veteran on the front lines that was guiding me and helping me with everything I had to do and I was ever assigned to. He was a very, very close Korean friend. And, and he was in our company. Sergeant Chung Young. Young Byu. Chung Young Byu. Okay. The average home in Korea after a landing. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> they tried to keep re religious services with whatever or whoever in, in within our area the best they could. This is a little 12-year-old friend that I made up on the front lines who was lost somewhere along with the Rock Army or whatever. I don't know what happened to him, but I adopted him as my personal friend, and he was with me at all times. And uh, he even got to meet my wife through a letter. Is that right? Yeah, Yeah, and she sent him a wristwatch. Oh, wow. Was he like your houseboy or what? Uh no, he uh, was, no, he was fighting the war with oh, the Rock Army. Oh, okay. But during campaign, you know, when they, he got, I mean, but he wanted, he wanted somebody to care for him. Mm. And it's going to get more interesting mm. with this what kind of stuff. We were being hammered, and then uh, the rear echelon called in the, the Air Force, and this picture is of a... Our, our Air Force out with napalm bombs, wiping out the Chinese that were giving us trouble. This is how I looked when I was watching the airstrike. Hmm. This, this picture is of a full gear, in uh, combat gear, in case of a gas attack or whatever. Okay? This, I'm Catholic. This is a Jewish boy who saved me from myself by going out and drinking sake, blah, blah, blah. This guy helped me find my way back. And he, I asked him, help me, whatever you want me to do, I'll help you. Okay? You got that? Mm -hmm. Okay. He got me on the road again. That's, this is a fire plan that I was assigned to that already announced in case of an attack coming from 10 Hill 1062, which we were waiting, and I was waiting for the company or the next company, whoever was going to go out and try to take that hill. We, I didn't do anything except set up my fire plan to be ready for in case of a rebuttal, in case they rebuttal. And 
you have to study that to know it. Mm. Okay, this is the average living quarters that we had on the line because we were encircled. Mm. This is Sleeper Hill where the Chinese had surrounded us and kept us there for six months. Now, how would you get, uh, were they uh, bringing air, airlift supplies into How did you get supplies in if you were surrounded? Well, we, uh, modern day, we call it commandos. They were, had, they were fearless. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Truck drivers, anybody, helicopters. A lot of it was, uh, you have no idea how much it took for a helicopter pilot to fly in there and right out in front of them pick up a wounded guy. Yeah. And they did it. Hmm. That these were absolute heroes wow. to us. Never ever really met one. Wow. wow. But they were there. This is the back of Zebra Hill, which we very seldom ever saw. But they, we had uh, fire support back there too. I didn't see it, hmm. but we had it back there. This is Hill 509 that a, a friendly company that was assigned to us was kind of hold yet with the help of us, if they ever needed us, we would come down. It was low enough that we would have to force our way in and meet the enemy. Hmm. This, this is, uh, if we wanted to eat, we had to climb down from that hill, and that is a mess hall, a chow, where there was a hot meal waiting if you felt like you wanted to eat. We forced ourselves a meal a day down that hmm. hill. Mm. And we did meet the enemy coming up. Mm. This is where a guy had to stay to relax and get his bearings again. You can't see him, but they're in there with medics. It was kind of an R and R type situation. No, or? it was more medical. Oh, okay. Treatment for a guy that lost it up front. Oh, okay. So the medical war worked for him and see if they want to send him back up or take him out completely. Ah, okay. And then the medic would stay in touch with the helicopter's crews. They were organized way past us. Mm. They were a lot, there was a lot going on around us we didn't know about. Yeah, yeah. But we knew it was our friendly, mm. our friends. Okay, I want to I, I orient you to this picture. I had been down to the chow line, but we, like I said, we had to go down to get our, if you wanted a hot meal. On the way back up the hill, it was a steep climb back to my position. And then my friend, I took basic training, he was from uh, Los Alamos, Colorado, and it was, his name was Johnny Melcher, and he, he hollered at me and he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. Okay. He said, come have a few words? I said, yep, I can be right up. So I climbed up. He was, a look, he was according to what they told me now, I didn't see this, but this is what they told me. I went up and I had a little visit sitting on an outpost. And as I took, I didn't even make it to the foot of the hill when he got knocked off by a sniper. Oh, boy. Oh, wow. You know what I'm saying? Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't see this. Yeah. But this is what the, but my, I tried to track him down when he came back, but it didn't work out. Mm. This is where I, when the uh, artillery and everything came in, and uh, we, there wasn't a thing you could do but wait and wait and wait. I would give him a little volley, a, a, a brief, uh, uh, what do you want to call it, a study of, of what to do to get out of the fire. And if you want to take a nap, it's a foxhole. Mm. And he, he, he accepted that, boy. That was, I made a mistake and fell asleep in it. <laughs> and somebody took that picture. Okay, this is our, this is our post office. And we had a mail clerk. I never re ever really saw him. But he would, under heavy fire, if there was, whatever it was, he would get up there and get those letters to the rear so they could be mailed. Mm. He was a cop. This is my little friend Wally I previously talked about that we found over there. And I wrote a letter home to mom, my wife, and I was bragging what a nice little guy he was. So she sent him that wristwatch, and there he is bragging about his wristwatch. Mm. This is a picture of the outside of the camp where you hand your laundry out. Uh, we were, at that time, we had moved uh, off, off of the line and we were in downtown Pusan 
in the Dyson uh, Di somewhat uh, 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 military academy that was held by the Japanese during the Second World War. But they redone it, and that was a, ca a camp for us. And we, there was company after company that lived there, and this was one of the girls on the outside of the fence that would reach in and take your laundry, but you had to be honest enough to pay her, mm. you know, which we always did. Yeah, this is downtown Busan, and in the rear, you can still see the hills are way off in the distance, but the Koreans call them China Mountain. Whether it was occupied by the Chinese yet or whether our troops were still trying to take it, I have no clue. Mm. This is a picture of the main transportation that the Korean people used. Just look at the rear end of that machine. It's a part of an old vehicle converted into a rickshaw. Mm. And, okay, after I, after I found my life, again, to that Jewish friend, I, uh, he, he got me oriented to doing what's uh, real good for myself. We went to the United Nations headquarters where the, and signed up for orphanage support. Now, this is my little first guy that the lady brought out. He said, he wants to be your friend. And if you want to come to town and just spend time with him or whatever you want to do, there's going to be more. But this is the little guy who's in love with you. Hmm. This is what the United Nations headquarters looked like where the orphanages, uh, I was never in it. I was in one part of it at the front gate and stuff in a military area where we signed up for support or area or what. And we were not needed as guards or anything. We were just there to communicate with the Korean people for why we were there to help their country. Okay. And, okay, these were two, two of my senior officers that were in charge of me who gave me a very bad time, friendly, <laughs> picking on me, steady for one reason or the other, but they were the best guys. And I've often wondered the one, the shorter, shorter one was named, was Skag, Holly Skag, and I've often wondered if he was the brother of Ricky Skag. Hmm. Hmm. This was me on a kind of a, in, it was kind of a, a, a non-commissioned officer's uh, inspection, how I would look when I had to go on guard mount, taking out my six guys on a guard mount for security guarding something. This is the way I had a look. Okay, this is this is part of the United Nations Cemetery uh, area. I never really knew where I was, but it's part of the cemetery. I had a chance to take a picture of the United Nations Cemetery in Korea. Mm. Now we're switching over to the military. After I got uh, I got done in Korea, I got transferred. To Koji Island, which was 60 miles south of Korea, uh, on an island named Koji Island, and uh, totally lost. I was totally lost with the rest of the guys that went with me. But this is the camp. You, you know, it was a North uh, Chinese prison camp, North Korean prison. We didn't know, but we were assigned to to, to protect this camp or be in uh, security for it. Hold security at all costs. The third division got wiped out there. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is our top security. If you look, if you look close, you got a man in the tower with a full tail light, light machine gun covering, at, and then, there, then there's another security walking guard underneath for up close attack. We had a double security on each one of these posts. I, as a non-commissioned officer, I was kind of assigned to organizing in the next detail to replace guards. And I was, uh, sometimes, not always, this was between a lot of guys and me, that we did a di this chore. It was the guard mount falling out for inspection to cover the area and make sure proper replacement was in order. In other words, because they had to communicate from one post, one guy had to communicate with them and relieve each other. But we had to take them out there. When I was over there, I had no enemies. 
uh, these guys were friends that I could never ever light a cigarette without sharing a pack with them. Mm. And I, I trust them to the hill. Okay, this, this is a figure, this is a figure inspection falling out that has to be placed out. Our detail was just a little bit short, so you see to the side where the following company volunteered other men to come over that were in our guard mount. They were under our jurisdiction for the time being while they were on duty. This is the time that the tents that we lived in, and it had hardwood floors in there, and had nice sleeping quarters in there, if you call it, you know, want to call it that. But if you look out front, we had an irrigation ditch to carry the water away from it, and we had a detail that would keep that open. And that's what these guys were doing, making sure that if we got hit by high water or some kind, that these guys would make sure to, uh, to, to keep the, the water flowing. This is more so part of a full scale, part of the compounds, the way the, the what the prisoners lived in. Mm. Part, okay, this is the main gate where anything that went in and out, uh, and we had a, a lot of times we had double security, a guard on each side, but there's only one guard on there, and there's two signs, one on each side that said, he is your prisoner, guarding. And that meant when vehicles had to go in and out, you had better be ready to secure, secure the environment. I have to do it when I'm thinking of it. Okay, this is what they call uh, road security. This was on the machine gun towers and all, it was a, just a patrol security driving and like the police, like police patrol in a city, these guys in the Jeep had to look for the obvious, and they were with, equipped with full field equipment for a firefight, and also with a field phone to warn the towers what they had to break out or whatever it takes. And they would drive constantly around that compound, and they, to me, what they told me was, the average drive was 12 miles around the compound. Mm. Okay, this, this is the, uh, uh, when I left Korea and got, the, got assigned uh, to, to Yokohama Bay, I was still aboard ship, we weren't allowed off ship. We were going to our destination and this is where we wound up. This was gonna be our home in the, the first cavalry. That's where, it, and the, the first cavalry had been hit so hard, I can't prove any of this, but the first cavalry had been hit so hard that what was left of the first cavalry was stationed in, in uh, Hokkaido. And what it was, it, we were just there for a sur surveying the terrain and I got shipped in. This is Sergeant John, John no, <laughs> Sergeant John, who uh, went through the inspection with the officers, made sure that our inspection went across past the officers passing it or correcting what wasn't right if we wanted to pass for that day going into Ch Chitosi Town. But we never failed, we made uh, it. I, I don't even know how to explain this. I wound up as a gunnery instructor and there were only two of us that came off of the front lines that went in there like mm. that. The rest of them were all from the 1st Cavalry, and we had, we had uh, the, keep the 1st Cavalry. In other words, we were assigned to t uh, bullies, terrorists, guys that were mistreated, they were hard fighters. Mm. We had to figure out what we were going to do with this. Right. But we made friends in a hurry with mm. them. Okay, this is me at my very best. I was reassigned as an uncommissioned officer to be pull security guard at the higher officers. In other words, I was one of the nice guys being picked out to walk the plank over there in the NCO's barracks. Huh. Now, the NCO barracks, they had their whatever in there, whatever. One of us walked as a fire guard inside of the building, 
But I got the nice duty to walk guard in front of the building for the obvious. And I, you talk about being lonesome. Oh, wow. Mm. Some of those officers, I know, come on. This is the ship we went over on. This is the ship that we came home on. Notice how you're arriving back in docking at uh, port in Seattle. Okay, this, when I, when we hit the Hokkaido Islands, this was, I was a heavy drinker. <laughs> and I met the friend in the bar. This, this picture was drawn on a rice cloth by a, a, a Japanese friend that I bought a beer for. And he go, 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 be back. And I said, okay. So he sat down on a rice cloth and he drew that picture. Wow. Uh. And we become friends for six, six whatever I was up there. He oh, was my that. favorite friend. And he, he was a guest at that beer hall. The uh, coach sure. of me still taken during my military career. And uh, I guess that's about it, Joe. Oh, I'll tell you. Okay, this, these pictures are going to be from uh, pictures of my brother in the Second World War. I'm so proud of him. And this Palix, the oldest one. And then this is Clarence. This is Frank. This is Mike. This is Johnny. This is Julius. And needless to say, he's a 30-year man, hmm. by the way. MP between London and Alabama. These these were some of my assignment badges that I had uh, on my uniforms in time. This is the history of the, uh, the the unit that I fought with. When I say Korea, this is what I'm talking about. And this was issued to you when you were over there. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. That's the history of the unit before mm -hmm. me and after me. Okay. And this this is. Uh, when I hit Japan and become non-commissioned officer, this was my guide for regulating the troops, you know, for regulation. And it's a study book. Okay, this, this is a picture of an award that I got from President Sigmund Rhee with a bunch of the United Nations troops that were fighting for Korea during the war. And it's a highly stated, I, I read it, but I don't remember it all. But we were not alone. We were not alone. If you look at it, the United Nations emblem is there in the blue marking. The Korean flag is on the other side. We did our job well, and we got credit for it. Individually, by the, by the president, or, or by the, yeah, the president of South Korea. On the, on the 50th anniversary. Yeah, if you want to take it. There's the award medal for doing that. Okay. Now the the rest of the rest of these things here, the other two are awards that I got from the American Legion and and the different groups that I belong to, and are. Uh, Kind of recognition, any recognition of the sports. I, I was, I've been with the American Legion for 60 years. Hmm. And that there goes back to the Korean. Take note of the rifle, the flintlock on top. That, I, if I remember right, that was, that was handed to me by General, or pinned on me by, by General, I think it was Trudeau at that time. That's they, your, your combat know, infantry badge. Yeah, the combat infantry badge. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom, if you see in that picture, my name in Korean, so people know who they were talking to. <laughs> hey, Dad, can you tell us what each of the badges on the plaque stand for? The badge on where? Up there where Brad's. Oh, that's, that's the units I was with. It's, it's, that's where I took basic training. The 10th Mountain. With the... With the uh, uh, 10th Mountain. Okay, I lost my train of thought. The 10th Mountain Division. 10th yeah. Mountain Division? Yeah. No, back that up. I wasn't with the Mountain Division. We were known as the 10th Infantry Division. In, uh, I'm sorry. Infantry yes, division. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, got that corrected. Now, that's the 1st Cavalry that I was in Japan, and then the Hourglass is the 7th Division I fought with in Korea. 
small world, huh? Yeah. Uh, okay, this is what you do when you're pulling security guard in the prison compound. I made these little cars out of anything that was laying on the desk. Carving uh, and this, uh, there was absolutely no tools there, but I crafted them and I threw them in my duffel bag. And when I got them back to the States, they were still in my duffel bag. So uh, Donna and I, we went through the process of painting them. Huh. You, you know what I'm saying? Huh. She, she was, uh, and if you want to see what, uh, right there. That's what a Russian Jeep looked like in the 50s. Huh. This is a little hot rod. This was the Buick that one of my friends was telling, describing. But this guy, I can't believe how I turned that one out. And that little white and brown one was the car I was telling you about that I needed tires for. <laughs> I mean, but you got to remember though too, you only made those, you only made those, uh, in your spare time, I was sitting for eight hours trying to figure out how to make that little car. So I finally took a 22 caliber cartridge, like we always didn't bit the head off, and took the casing and shoved it into the racer and cut tires out of it. <laughs> you follow that? Uh -huh. And that little guy there was one of the units that I. I, mean, I was so proud when I made that one because in civilian life, I, I we were working with one of those, you know, ditch diggers. Uh -huh. And the guy, the guy told me I was I was running the truck and he was doing the digging back there. And he, he kept telling me, he said, "Keep moving, keep moving." He said, "I said, keep moving." I I pointed back. I said, "Your scoop is down." And he wouldn't listen to me. And he kept driving, and he pulled the scoop off. See the scoop. He broke something in the upper. And he said, is that what you meant? And I said, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> Don't move it. Okay, this is this is a belt buckle that I, I got from, they call it the enemy, but he was a friend to me. I treated him right, he treated me, and he gave me this belt buckle. And I didn't find out until just a few months ago when my daughter took it out and had it analyzed. And what it is is a friendship buckle that he gave because I get, when we were moving them and he was under uh, in formation, I offered him a cigarette because we were allowed to smoke. I gave him a cigarette and he stepped out of rank and he came over and he handed me presento. Mm. He said presento. Okay, these are, this is my uh, wedding, one of my wedding pictures with my mom and dad and my uh, father and mother-in-law. It's kind of a at the last minute shot, but. It's going to have to do for, for now. Okay, this is a picture of my family taken possibly five years ago, JC, was it? I don't know, Jim. Okay, we'll leave it at five years. This is Mom and I talking about the world crisis and how we're going to solve them. <laughs>